chapter where we sit, a quarter of a century, uh, a quarter of the way through the 21st century, and uh, I point to three indicators. The first is that, in spite of the Paris Climate Agreement, we're still on the course to somewhere in the region of three degrees global warming by the end of the century. The Secretary General of the United Nations has said that that is an unlivable world, is probably the expression. And yet, uh, that unlivable world is still where we are consigning our children and grandchildren uh, to spend their adult lives. And uh, that's a reality that we will have to face and put on our shoulders. The second indicator is that the Handel Panel for Sustainable Ocean Economy has carried out expert analysis that shows that full implementation of ocean-based climate solutions now ready for action are things like green shipping, sustainable aquaculture, uh, renewable offshore energy, that these things could reduce the global emissions gap by up to 35% on a 1.5 degrees pathway by 2050. So well noting the vital role of the ocean in achieving our Paris climate agreement, the third indicator is as follows. The State of the Ocean Report, issued by the Intergovernmental Ocean and Atlantic Commission, did I get that right? Intergovernmental yeah. uh, Ocean and Atlantic Commission in 2022 said that, and I quote, currently, the quantitative description of the ocean is drastically incomplete, incomplete. Current knowledge is insufficient to effectively inform the solutions to the ocean that humanity is facing in the world. So when we combine the prospects of an unlivable world with ocean's potential to mitigate a large part of what's necessary to avoid the worst, but find ourselves held back by the insufficiency of our knowledge of the ocean, it becomes clear that we're entering a seminal week for the world, or the world momentous, uh, in my opinion. But here in Barcelona, we'll be confronting the massive scientific talent and the responsibilities ahead. And we will be charting a course for the remainder of the decade that will deliver us from that insufficiency, hopefully ushering us into the respectful relationship with the ocean that our dire situation demands. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure we're all aware of the key role that G20 plays in global economic cooperation. With Brazil holding the G20 presidency this year, there's a high expectation that the G20 leaders summit and the ministerial meeting occurring in Brazil later this year will be something special. For instance, in the ocean community's viewpoint, Brazil's embracing of the O20 initiative is highly stimulating, and I'm very encouraged to learn to have learned that this year, O20 is being coordinated by the UNESCO Chair for Ocean and Sustainability, hosted by the University of Sao Paulo, there's Alex, uh, in collaboration with the UN Global Compact, thank you Eric, and the World Economic Forum, thank you Alfredo, and the Brazilian Biodiversity Fund, they're here, uh, and uh, the National Institute for Ocean Research, in addition to several national and international funds. So O20 recognizes the role that the, uh, of sustainable ocean industries, finances and scientific insights, uh, and recognizes that these are now being more relevant to overcoming critical global issues of energy and food and trade security. So recognizing that G20 countries have a dis disproportionate influence on these issues, we see great opportunity for O20 to help drive the necessary transitions and commitments to move to a truly sustainable uh, the economy. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to seize this opportunity to put forward three multilateral asks through which O20 could make a huge difference to right for ocean action. Firstly, there is the fact that science tells us that, that if we do not preserve 30% of the planet by 2030, we will lose vast swathes of planet's biodiversity. A loss which may well have existential consequences for Homo sapiens. The global biodiversity framework, to which all nations committed in 2022, includes a target to do 30% of the planet's land and sea by 2030. Since the ocean covers about 70% of the Earth's surface, how are we going to fast track 
the selection and implementation of biodiversity rich, climate smart areas of the ocean to meet the 30 by 30 challenge on time. And remember the consequences if we miss that time. The ask is that O20 brings this challenging question to G20 countries so that they, that they will be better prepared to answer decisively when we meet in Colombia in October. Why Colombia in October? That is the, uh, the part of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And is that too soon? Well, I'm sorry. Um, 2030 is too soon. So it's a great moment for us to uh, make those decisions on the fast track when we get together in October in Colombia. In the meantime, we're going to work out how I would say at least a dozen strands of dialogue that we were working on, how to trust them. The second principle, and I really think both may be a huge work that we have got. The second consideration is the outsized damage being done to the ocean by harmful fisheries. There's an item of $20, 30 billion dollars worth of public monies being uh, spent per annum abetting illegal fishing and supporting the capacities of the fishing industry. Negotiations to agree on banning such subsidies came very close to the but still the reasons of the term is still to be Combined resources of G20 could well be put to good use by trade-offs and mediation to assist them in the include this key element of SDG 14 is The third ask, uh, ask relates to the plastic stream, currently under international negotiations. For we and the planet are permanently poisoned by plastics forever chemicals, the tone and intent of the treaty negotiations must be heard in the direction of major positive outcomes. A plastic treaty is no chance, a once in a generation chance to deal decisively with the plague of plastic pollution that we have put on the planet. The ask is that O20 actively involve itself in encouraging the 20 countries to insist on the one one that finally brings a random plastic and plastic chemicals in particular to people. Ladies and gentlemen, closing, I'd like to recognize Brazil's enlightened leadership of G20 this year and its determination to progress in the O20 platform for SDG 14 to 10 and the Ocean Country Brazil. As we strive towards the next UN Ocean Conference in Nice in June next year, O20's work will assume a great deal of importance. With that in mind, I hope to meet up with many of you in Latin America this year at the Immersive Change High Level Ocean Meeting being held in Costa Rica in uh, June, or perhaps, as mentioned, at the uh, Biodiversity Talk in Colombia in October. In all these gatherings, we expect to see O20 present. Uh, as we undertake honest assessment of the progress of SDG 14's implementation, along with breakthroughs in the ocean science and financial solutions that we need for the sustainable economy to progress and the levels required for future human security. It's said that knowledge without action is wasteful, and that action without knowledge is foolishness. So ocean scientists and ocean activists as mature working hand in the Gulf, achieve the ocean we want for future generations, and that we'd be ready to assist O20 with his tasks when they require extra attention and so on. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for those clear asks for the for the ocean twenty and the work that we're doing. And I want to say that it's always very inspiring to listen to you. And as a youth representative at the European Global Compact, it's very good to hear you for this kind of urgency and action and the collaboration that we need. So our next speaker is truly representative of one of the reasons we are here today at the Decade of Ocean Science. And it's fantastic to have you, Dr. Amir Krishna, Director of Marine Policy Center, the world's Pole oceanographic institution, and senior advisor to the WHOI, President on Ocean and Climate Policy, to bridge science and politics because that is really what we need. So Dr. Ramakrishma, I wanted to ask you, in your view, what are the synergies between the ocean work at the G20 and the ocean decade? Of course, yours. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for that introduction and for that uh, uh, very relevant question, given the fact that we're meeting here in Barcelona during the Euro Ocean Decade Conference. Uh, before I respond specifically to the question that you raised, uh, let me say a word about uh, Thompson and his leadership. Uh, in fact, when you look at the range of conferences that we see taking place around the world, and the importance attached to the topic, whether it is blue economy, finance, uh, the importance of science and their implications for policy development, and the connection between all the various topics that the world community is facing. I can't think of another person more suited to speak on it than uh, uh, Dr. Thompson. And he has been an inspiration. So it's great to share the stage with him. And I want to also say a word to my friend. Uh, uh, <laughs> And, and it, it, it's a great treat to have uh, be part of this meeting that uh, Alexander Tura um, uh, is organizing and I have uh, great confidence that he can take this uh, topic forward in a manner that uh, Ambassador Thompson talked about. And one thing that is common to all of us on this podium is that we have been talking about the role of ocean in sustainable development for many years. And the topic that we are trying to address in the context of the Brazilian leadership has antecedents to other G20 meetings. And the reason why G20, and you know, I'll come to that in a, in a, in a while, uh, is that no matter how much attention that you give to ocean in various topics, there is a tendency amongst the member countries to approach it in a very siloed manner. And we cannot afford to continue doing that any longer. And amongst all the fora that we have in the world, there is nothing more suited to take on the ocean in terms of it, all of its various uh, connections that we have with sustainable development agenda than G20. And if you allow me to, to go back in time to Indonesia's presidency of G20, that's probably the first time we have heard of O20. Um, and that was within the context of the G20 meetings, and G20 meetings, until recently, were meetings that were held in the capitals of the countries mostly. Uh, but while Indonesia brought the ocean agenda to the G20, it still remained very much in the capital uh, focused attention. But when it came to India, G20 was all over the world. Uh, large as it is, every delegate coming to speak on any topic on the G20 is invited to go to different parts of the country, and many Indians also had not been to those parts, you know. Uh, but so the G20 agenda was really uh, incorporated into the country's agenda, and that I think a very good thing. Um, and not only that, uh, Indian government also decided to have a specific topic on ocean, you know, three major issues, blue economy, very marine plastic uh, pollution, and very carbon dioxide removal. And not only did they have this as a part of the agenda, they actually had a negotiated agreement among the G20 parties that was annexed to the uh, uh, conclusions of uh, the G20 ministers of environment and, uh, uh, and, and climate. Uh, now, uh, under Alexander Kura's leadership, we are not just taking it to the country, within the country, you know, to various cities, but bringing it outside and connecting uh, what they're trying to do with ocean agenda into uh, this part. Uh, so it, it's very important. And uh, one question is, what can G20 do, and why is that the, the, the critical forum? And, and I want to say, um, coming from the Oceanographic Institution, uh, and we are proud of saying that it's one of the large, it is the largest independent oceanographic institutions in the world. And we felt exactly the way uh, uh, Peter Thompson and others have said uh, that we need to focus this and bring the community to it. So we began that in Shaman Shake, a top, uh, climate cup, and then took it to uh, the Y meeting. And the idea is to just bring and all the oceanographic institutions and all the various philanthropic entities that 
our focus on ocean is to come together and they say that we need to work together where, and you know how to do that and, and, and so on. So the, the what we have for G20 right now is to build on the momentum that is that was there from Indonesia to India to Brazil and the movement to South Africa. And you might say, well, why is that the important problem? That, 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 that's a big question. And I will answer that simply by reading, if you allow me, the chapeau of the declaration that was negotiated in India. And it, it begins, building upon the 2030 agenda for sustainable development, particularly the SDG 14, as well as the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework the DPNJ Agreement on Land Loss and the Lisbon Declaration of the Human Ocean Conference, the United Nations Environment Assembly Resolutions on Plastic Pollution, the WTO Agreement on Fisheries Subsidies, and the broader ongoing efforts of the G20 on issues related to the oceans and sustainable growth. There is no other intergovernmental forum that can combine all these issues the way G20 can. And given the power and influence that the G20 countries exercise, if they can take all these issues together, you know, we really are able to get a future that where ocean is not just left to the oceanographers, uh, ocean is not just left to the UN Ocean Conference, or because of the importance that we attach to climate to climate uh, uh, scientists, but to everybody. And you know, to the sustainable development agenda and equity and social justice, which is all critical component parts of this declaration of the you to see and I really hope that in, under Alexander Kudra's leadership that we will be able to amplify these and bring countries closer together in advancing the uh, collective agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you for speaking about how the G20 was first brought by Indonesia and then taken by India. And I think for us it's really important that we work and we work and build upon the work that has already been done, continuing to South Africa, as you mentioned, and the USA, to ensure that ocean is at the heart of, um, of these forums, as we know the potential lies has to, to really mitigate climate change and so many other of the disasters we're facing in this world, basically. So thank you very much for, for mentioning that. Um, our next speaker today is my own boss, as I said, Eric, who is the head of the ocean work at the UN Global Compact, representing the private sector at the UN. And Eric, it will be very good for us to learn how the private sector can play a role in the G20, and also how can this collaboration strengthen the work of the ocean decade and vice versa. Very simple question for you. <laughs> Extremely inspiring to uh, hear all this, and as you said, that uh, some of us have been working on this for years. But my colleague here, Rebecca, put it far, you know, rising star in the uh, system, and I think it's so great that you just take this job of moderating us, but she's not only moderating this, she is together with Rubens here and other colleagues from the UNGC here, here is also running um, the coordination of the local networks. So the UN Compact is a big organization in the UN, started 24 years ago by Kofi Annan as a special initiative for the private sector. Uh, 40 companies came together to set some goals, standards and ambitions. It's now 25,000 companies. And they have local networks in more than 70 countries, and they have 700 staff. And Rebecca is coordinating uh, with the local network uh, how we can have a bottom up approach with a really global footprint of all ages, all typical of all kinds of companies, but also NGOs and academic institutions. So it's a strong force, and I'm really glad that you could be here. I think it's an extremely important moment in time, uh, and it's in short time, it's in November already. So we really have to hit the ground running after this meeting. I know that Alexander is already eager to run, so that we can start. <laughs> exactly. But and, and Brazil's presidency has just explained the process now. It's uh, had three clear uh, uh, 
topics uh, for us to address, and, and it's really hunger and food insecurity for food systems. It's sustainable development with focus on renewable energy, and it's rethinking multilateralism. And the ocean plays an instrumental role in this. And we're going to inform the presidency and all member states of the G20 in November about all the opportunities that the ocean industries have in the neighboring countries. And it has to be science based. And I'm glad to see that the private sector has really stepped up its reliance to science. It's not only nice to have, it's a precondition to qualify their financial dispositions and investments. And the science based target initiative is really a proof of ability. It's become the gold standard of how you uh, qualify industry standards and, uh, and strategies of different companies. Setting lines with young is the second part of the payment method where you have to have a science based target for your deep conversation. These things work and I find that very inspiring. So, I'd like to call.